Good evening. I want to welcome everybody to this week's happy hour session. Um, if you have any questions at all uh, about any of the entities covered, please feel free to email us at uh, education at sagesdx.com and uh, someone will get back to you. Or, or you can uh, text or call me. My cell phone number is 210 416 4815. It's my real pleasure to introduce tonight's host, Dr. Muhammad Khan, uh, to you. Dr. Khan is currently the DermPath uh, Fellow at uh, ProPath in Dallas. He's uh, APCP boarded, did his uh, pathology training at uh, Cedars Mount Sinai, and uh, after that did a uh, fellowship training in endocrine and head and neck pathology uh, at uh, Yale uh, before coming to Dallas. Uh, Dr. Uh, Khan will be discussing paniculitis, and we're we're uh, thrilled to to have him uh, hosting tonight's session. He's an uh, excellent uh, dermatopathologist and uh, uh, a very nice guy to boot. Uh, Mohammed, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you for that uh, great introduction. Um, and so with that, um, we're going to get started on the cases. If you guys have any questions, like Dr. Davis says, uh, said, you can sort of, you know, um, ask for my email or you can directly email Dr. Uh, Davis and we'll be happy to answer any questions on these cases. So with that, we're going to go to our first case, uh, a great case. Um, so as Dr. Uh, Davis mentioned, we're going to be talking about paniculitis today. And... Before I even start with the case, I want to sort of lay down the principles of what I look at um, when I approach a paniculitis case. So number one uh, thing you want to look at is you want to see if the inflammation is predominantly septal or predominantly lobular. And I say that because I've used the word predominant because inflammation in real life and paniculitides is never just lobular or septal. It's usually you know, it, it, there's usually some spillage. Number two uh, is you want to look at the type of inflammation, the type of inflammatory cells. Are there neutrophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells, histiocytes, which can give you a clue into what the uh, ideology may be of the paniculitis. And number three is you want to look for the presence of vasculitis. And we're going to cover some entities in this um, unknowns that, you know, uh, we're going to kind of talk about that. So uh, let's move on. So in this case, you know, you can see that, you know, there's definitely septal thickening and this is a, pre a septal predominant paniculitis. And, and at low power, you can kind of see that there's, uh, you know, a, an infiltrate uh, that looks dark blue. So we're definitely seeing lymphocytes here. And there's certainly at this power, I'll go higher a little bit, there's certainly no vasculitis. So then, We'll go down and we'll kind of see what is comprising this. So certainly we have lots of lymphocytes, giant cells. And you can kind of see the giant cells here. We also have some histocytes. So it's kind of a mixed inflammatory infiltrate. We also have some EOs here. And usually in this paniculitis, you know, it depends on the stage of biopsy. You know, early on, you can get, you know, EOs, neutrophils, kind of fully developed, you get more granulomatous, histiocytic infiltrate. And then later on in this entity, you can get like a, on this interface between the septa and the lobule, you can kind of almost get like a granulation tissue. And when it sort of burns out. And another interesting finding. So, you know, when you're talking about septal paniculitis, you don't have any options. And this, this is sort of the prototype for that. And this is erythema nodosum. And I wanted to kind of bring your attention to this finding here. So almost, you can kind of see this cleft here and, and the cleft so, uh, the size and shape can vary. And then there's almost this radial arrangement of histocytes here. So this is called, uh, described first by Meissner. This is um, uh, Meissner's radial uh, granuloma, which is uh, another finding that you can see um, it's most characteristic of erythema nodosum, but you can have it in other paniculitis as well. And 
So this is a great example of erythema nodosum. And obviously, you know, erythema nodosum is a response, is a paniculitis to something else that's going on in the body. So you want to, you know, want to make sure, you know, you rule out malignancy, make sure uh, maybe streptococcal infection, uh, inflammatory process, drugs. So a lot of things can do that. And clinically, erythema nodosum presents as these, you know, uh, anterior um, shin and the kind of these nodules on the anterior shin that are uh, erythematous and painful. So uh, that's a great example of that. We're gonna move on to our next case. Can I arrange this a bit? All right, so now, you know, the next case kind of highlights a different pattern. Here you can kind of see more of a lobular paniculitis. The, and uh, as far as the type of inflammation here, you can kind of, um, you know, you have a, a dark cell is just at this power. So, you know, those are lymphocytes. And, and there's another interesting finding here. And that is that you kind of see this periodnexal infiltrate here, kind of around the acrine ducts. So you get a, a periodnexal lymphocytic infiltrate here. Um, which is which doesn't happen in a lot of paniculitis. So if, when you have that, you kind of, uh, along with the findings that I'll kind of mention like that. So uh, you're kind of only left with the, your options are very limited. So here you can see the classic finding in this case, you kind of see fat necrosis because you don't see the actual nuclei of the fat. And the fat becomes, uh, uh, gets this like hyalinized changed, um, which is basically hyaline change. And it, it, it it, it looks very kind of has this like almost like if somebody put lipstick uh, on the membrane of the of fat cell. And that's a pretty characteristic finding um, for um, lupus paniculitis or lupus profundus. And that's what this is. Other findings include these aggregates of uh, lymphocytes, but there's another cell type here. So you can kind of see here that there are these scattered cells with the perinuclear uh, cough and eaten eccentric uh, nucleus. And that's, uh, those are plasma cells. So you have that, sometimes you'll get germinal center formation. This one I think has a, uh, doesn't really have really good, uh, it's not a really good well-developed germinal centers. Um, and, uh, and, and, and also the, another interesting finding, I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but sometimes what you can see are these karyohectic debris. And some people think that that's actually the lymphocytic plasia uh, in comparison to what you see in uh, uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis where you get neutrophilic debris. And that kind of makes sense because you know lupus is an autoimmune disorder and you know, it's targeting all these antigens and then you know, lymphocytes you know, are certainly uh, could be affected and that's why you can get this sort of change. So that's also another characteristic finding. And um, so this is a very, a very great case of uh, lupus um, paniculitis. And you often wanna kind of go up in the epidermis and kind of make sure there's no interface because you can often have uh, discoid lupus uh, or um, interface change uh, as well in, on top of the paniculitis. I think in one to 3% of the cases you can have like, um, you know, cutaneous, you can have involvement um, um, by cutaneous uh, lupus. And about, um, so when I think of this, I also think, well, um, it, there's also a possibility the patient has systemic lupus erythematosus. So you wanna make sure you exclude that. Uh, about 50% of the cases don't have involvement by systemic lupus erythematosus. And classically in the clinical end, this is a paniculitis that unlike the other entities we're gonna talk about affects the upper extremities. Uh, and the head, it can even affect the kind of the head and neck area. So it, it's uh, different in that way as well. And then sometimes you can get mucin uh, depositions so, um, similar to what you would expect in lupus in the interstitium. Uh, so those are all clues that you can use uh, to make the diagnosis. Next case. So this is a great case to sort of contrast. Um, sorry, I flipped it the wrong way to contrast uh, in comparison to lupus paniculitis. So this case again is a lobular paniculitis. Um, and as you move in, you start to start to appreciate 
uh, well, lots of histiocytes. You see lots of histiocytes here. Uh, maybe even some giant cells. They're very foamy. Um, and we'll sort of move around. There's some eosinophils here. And sort of areas like this sort of catch your eye. So you kind of get these, I call it, I mean, I don't know if it's been described, but for me, it looks kind of like a ferrous field where um, the cell, the, there are these almost, there are lymphocytes that are sort of uh, protruding into the, um, the fat cell. So uh, it's called rimming. And this is a, a characteristic finding uh, in this entity. Um, and not only that, the, 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 the cells are sort of atypical. They're hyperchromatic, you know, they're not your small little lymphocytes. They're kind of atypical. And then the other characteristic finding is you get these histocytes and you have this like debris within the histocyte. And that's uh, also classic. That's called a, like a beanbag cell. Um, so uh, when you see this, uh, you should start thinking about uh, um, SPTCL or uh, subcutaneous paniculitis-like T-cell lymphoma. And you know, the differential is often uh, you know, lupus profundus and gamma delta T-cell lymphoma can also be in the differential. So I'll kind of go over some things you can utilize. So one, uh, one caveat I will, I'll kind of see up front is you know, there've been cases reported where you have findings of both lupus paniculitis and SBTCL in the same biopsy. And then there were cases reported where you have lupus sort of uh, evolving into SBTCL. So it's uh, kind of a murk, you're kind of, there are murky waters when, um, when these, uh, when you kind of have to think about these things. But uh, in practicality, you know, you sort of use those, you know, these uh, morphological characteristics. You can use clinical, you know, uh, lupus paniculitis. Um, usually, like I said, occurs with uh, if you have like discoid lupus lesions of that. Um, you know, you can kind of be rest assured that it's not SBTCL. Um, but you can also use IHC to help you out. So, uh, as far as IHC, SBTCL. The neoplastic cells are usually CD8 positive, um, and they're um, uh, whereas in uh, lupus they're typically CD4. Uh, you can uh, use chemists. Uh, you can use Ki67. So uh, when you do a CD68, it should highlight these cells, right? And SBTCL and the Ki should be high in these cells as well. Whereas in uh, lupus profundus, you know you don't have that. Then the Ki should be low. And lupus profundus, you can have aggregates of CD123 positive plasmocytoid dendritic cells, so you can use that as a clue. And you can have aggregates of CD20 positive cells that I think I sort of highlighted in that previous slide. Uh, so you can use all those screws. And then finally, you can use TCR rearrangement studies to separate out. Um, this can have TCR um, um, clonality by TCR, whereas you know lupus profundus may or may not. And finally, uh, as far as the diagnosis of gamma delta, this phenotype is alpha beta. So it's a CD8 positive cell that's alpha beta uh, TC, T cell receptor. Whereas uh, in gamma delta, you, know, have the, you have a uh, gamma delta T cell receptor and it's usually double negative. So it's a CD4, CD8 negative in that entity, usually a lot more aggressive uh, uh, than SBTCL. Patients are also a lot sicker. They present with ulcerations. And then um, the other important clue is in, SP, in uh, gamma delta, you don't, unlike SPTCL, which primarily involves the, uh, the fat, in, uh, in gamma delta, you can get involvement, of, usually get involvement of the dermis, and you can even have ulceration, plus the ulcerative lesions clinically. And, um, and yeah, so those are some of the things you can uh, sort of rely on. Finally, SPTCL, usually the lesions are occurring on the lower extremities. They have a really good prognosis unless you develop, 20% uh, of the cases develop hemophagocytosis syndrome or hemophagocytosis, and those have a worse prognosis. So you wanna keep that in mind. All right, our next case. So now we're gonna kind of switch to our, uh, so here, you know, Right off the bat, you kind of see that everything looks a little smaller. So maybe you can say that this is baby skin neonate. Um, 
and then uh, when you get to that uh, age group, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't have much choices when it comes to paniculitis. So that's uh, kind of a little cheat there. But um, so when you, when you do a look at this, it's, it's a lobular paniculitis, right? We don't have any vasculitis. The inflammatory infiltrate is predominantly lymphohistiocytic. And I would say more histiocytic than lymphocytes here. You have, so the characteristic finding is really this stuff here. So you have almost like a giant cell, which has a, almost uh, as a cleft and it has these crystals. You can kind of see them. They're, um, they almost, to me, they look kind of like um, they're arranged in uh, like um, one direction. Uh, um, and like here, you can kind of see them very well. Um, and that's classic for um, subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. And that entity presents in you know, neonates and it has a very good prognosis, has lots of inflammation, uh, can have calcification. Usually uh, patients, it presents on bony prominence, uh, prominences, but you know, it can present on a cheek, trunk, extremities, uh, kind of these nodules or wileacious uh, kind of nodules. Um, all, um, and then as compared, so uh, usually patients have like hypercalcemia and that's the, um, what, what uh, you know, uh, physicians will follow, clinicians will follow that just to make sure that the patient doesn't develop any complications from that. But in contrast, the other entity, if you didn't have the inflammation or you had very little inflammation, you can think about sclerema neonatarum. And that entity uh, usually presents, usually can involve the entire body, more generalized, and all um, has a very has a worse prognosis. But thankfully, because of good prenatal and postnatal uh, screening methods, now that entity is very rare. Uh, and yeah, so um, I think this is a really good example of, um, of the entity that I talked about, the former entity that I talked about. All right, moving on to our next case here. Let's see this. Okay. So now, in contrast to the other entities that I talked about, which had a lot more like lymphocytes, you can kind of like, you know, see that the uh, low power view was very dark. Here, it's kind of almost like has a pinkish color, right? And the paniculitis here is more lobular. You can kind of see the entrapped fat cells that this inflammation is involving. And then higher power, you can kind of go see and you can see that there's really no uh, vasculitis. So when you see stuff, uh, uh, this is a neutrophilic predominant vasculitis. And when you have that, you kind of kind of keep your mind open and um, kind of start thinking about different entities. But this is also a very characteristic finding in this particular entity. So this is actually alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency associated paniculitis. And you can see the, so you can kind of see this shredding, almost breakage of the collagen bundles. And that's actually sometimes in early alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency paniculitis, associated paniculitis, you can kind of just see that, you know, with a little bit of neutrophils. And that happens because the neutrophils, they actually release a elastase and also release alpha-1 antitrypsin. And patients that don't have that protease um, inhibitor, basically, have the overactive elastase. And it just like, like cuts through the fat, uh, the extracellular matrix, you know? And that's exactly what you're seeing here with a bunch of neutrophils. So, um, you know, you, know, you want to make sure you screen these patients for other uh, organ involvement like lungs and so forth. Uh, but if you didn't have that, let's say you just had the neutrophilic paniculitis, you wanna keep your um, differential open at that point and consider, you know, obviously infection is number one, the fungal atypical mycobacterial infections. You wanna keep um, traumatic uh, paniculitis in the differential and fictitial, maybe they're just injecting something. Um, you know, so you wanna, uh, you wanna have an open mind when you see neutrophils. All right, go to our next case. So this is another uh, lobular paniculitis. I would say it's kind of mixed, but mostly lobular. I can see a little bit of thickening of the septum here. So I may think that, you know, the septum is involved, but I think most of the process here is lobular. And then the com 
come the info infiltrate here uh, to me looks mixed because it's not usually it's not totally dark like i would expect in lymphocytic infiltrate it's kind of like different colors pink pale so i'm thinking that this is a mixed paniculitis at this point um and then look here this is vasculitis so we have a medium-sized vessel kind of right in the center dab center of the lobule here um we, and you have this fibonoid necrosis of this medium, almost medium-sized vessel, I would say. Because some people believe there are no large vessels in the um, in the in the in the skin. Um, and the other finding, so you have vasculitis. So when you have vasculitis, the next question should be: Well, is the infiltrate kind of centered just around that, or is it like diffusely involving everything? around it and what kind of infiltrate is it so in this case it's diffusely involving uh, all the fat around it is kind of spreading so um when you see that you should start thinking about erythema and derotum if you just had the vasculitis and you just had infiltrate kind of just centering around the vessel and the fat around it then i would start thinking about polyhydride and nodosa or um, migratory thrombophlebitis. And the way to differentiate between those two is to do an EVG stain in the clinical. But for this, for this presentation, I will kind of go into describing some of the findings we see in erythema and derotum. So one of the things you will notice here that there's, like I said, the infiltrate is mixed, right? So it's histiocytic and there's some EOs here, some maybe even some lymphocytes. So uh, and then sometimes you can maybe even see some neutrophils here. So uh, that's that's classic for uh, erythema and derotum. It's a lobular paniculitis. Clinically presents on the posterior uh, calves. Uh, it can it's a, unlike erythema nodosum. It's more of a chronic process, and it can ulcerate. Um, and it's there are two types of erythema and derotum or the first, I would say uh, the foremost is uh, the, the most important one is the one, or I should say not most important, but the uh, one of the subtypes is uh, erythema and derotum of basin, which is, a so, which is basically thought to be a tuberculate, uh, which means that, you know, it's, a, it's thought to be a reaction to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and if you ever did AFB or, you know, uh, cultures on this lesion here, you may not, you will probably not find a TB. Although some studies have shown P via PCR that you can actually pick up a mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, so it's basically that uh, a, rea a tuberculid reaction, hypersensitivity reaction type four to mycobacterium. The other uh, subtype is the white field, uh, which is a reaction to something else. Um, so it's important to keep in mind when you suspect or when you see, when you suspect erythema and derotum to make, to make sure uh, you, you ask the patient to be worked up for mycobacterium, my, mycobacterium tuberculosis. All right, we go to our next case. So this is another uh, great example, uh, another great case. I mean, so here uh, you can kind of see that this is a lobular paniculitis, but I want to kind of uh, bring your attention to what's happening in the superficial papillary dermis here. So you can kind of you can see that you know there's a there's almost like a nodular vascular prolif um, uh, proliferation here, and that's basically you know stasis, right? Nodular vascular proliferation, some hemosiderin there, um, maybe even some red cell extravasation, and uh, and then, so now that you know that you have stasis on the top, um, then you kind of go down and more in the fat. And then you start seeing this kind of change. So you can kind of see this almost this crenulation. Um, the fat, there's definitely like uh, like large, like almost like microcysts, like uh, in the fat. Um, microcystic change. There's this um, uh, this change here, which is kind of like this pink, crenulated uh, kind of change to the membranes of the fat. Um, there may be even some calcification. So this change here is called lipomembranous change. It's a type of uh, fat necrosis, and it's typically seen 
um, in patients who are have chronic and venous insufficiency or stasis, and um, and it's called lipodermatosclerosis. And um, these patients clinically present with these um, kind of um, uh, inverted wine bottle kind of legs uh, or with induration and even some erythema. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a great example of that entity. All right, moving to our next case. So this is a, a, a little bit uh, different in that it's really, it's not a punch biopsy like we've seen. It's kind of like a enucleation, right? You just kind of enucleated this uh, out and uh, there's really no normal here. You just have this thick capsule. And then centrally, you have like fat necrosis. You can see that there's really no nuclei in these fat uh, cells. Um, and it's sort of, it's uh, encapsulated and there may be even some calcifications. And I think I, in some other area, I saw some histiocytes. Uh, so this is sort of uh, good, for, um, uh, good for fat necrosis. Let me see if I can find that area with the histocytes. Um, let's see. Right, maybe here, these are some histocytes here. But um, yeah, so this entity is uh, basically called mo mobile encapsulated lipoma or nodular uh, cystic fat necrosis, and it's these patients just get these like mobile uh, nodules on their legs, and uh, yeah, it, it's thought to be sometimes, I mean, maybe due to trauma, and then you just have this kind of um, reaction to the trauma, and it kind of encapsulates the, the fat with the central fat necrosis, so it's a, it's a, it's a very unique entity. And then our final case, this is an Another, another great example of a very classic paniculitis. So this one, again, it's a lobular paniculitis, uh, uh, mixed inflammation, mixed um, uh, inflammatory infiltrate, I should say, no uh, vasculitis. And then right in the DAV center, you can kind of see this change. So this uh, to those of us trained in pathology, we see this sometimes in autopsy specimens when you can kind of get this uh, saponification, um, especially in the retroperitoneum around the pancreas. And that's exactly what this is. It's kind of the ghost of the fat cells with this kind of uh, amorphous pink degenerative change. And when you see that, that's pretty classic for pancreatic paniculitis. And uh, it's basically so. so there's something in the pancreas, whether it be a neoplasm, inflam in, uh, inflammatory condition, fistula, pancreatitis, name it, right? That's led to the release of pancreatic lipase or even amylase. And what happens that it gets released into the bloodstream and then you get these, in the, it goes to the skin and the fat and then digest the fat. And basically you get a foreign body reaction to that um, fat. Um, um, degeneration or saponification. And you can see these histocytes here. Sometimes I mean, you see neutrophils. So this is a really a foreign body reaction. It's not a, a primary paniculitis. And, and at times you can get um, uh, perforation of this material, like chalky material. You get perforation of that and uh, trans, almost like trans epidermal elimination of uh, that, that material there. And I, I do want to bring another entity that I think about when I think about this. I think about um, uh, mucor mycosis, or sorry, I should say mucor uh, rallus species, rhizopus mycormycosis. And I say that because there's been case reports of, of that, um, this kind of change, saponification, when you have the uh, mucor rallus species affecting the dermis. Uh, and it's because they secrete lipases and that can cause saponification of the fat uh, just like that and look just like this. So uh, you wanna make sure you're not missing a uh, incipient or indolent or, or um, easy to overlook uh, infection, fungal infection. All right, so um, that sort of concludes our, our presentation. 
Uh, and I thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. If, like I said, any questions, it can be forwarded over to Dr. Davis and I'll be happy to reply. Um, have a great day. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Always learn some new stuff. So that's, that's great. Uh, hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you.